Shin Megami Tensei 4 Apocalypse is one of the most divisive games in the entire franchise. What was originally envisioned as an enhanced re-release of SMT4 eventually mutated into something much more ambitious. Despite Apocalypse reusing a lot of assets from 4, it's its own beast entirely as it features all new characters, a new story, updated mechanics, and much more. The game was released in February of 2016 in Japan and September for us Western players. Critically speaking, Apocalypse was received rather well. Fan reaction, however, was a completely different story. There's a lot of people that love this game to death, and just as many that cite it as one of the worst Mega Ten titles. So for today's video, we're going to be taking a deep dive into Apocalypse to find out why it has such a mixed reception amongst fans. But before we get started, I just want to say that there are going to be spoilers for SMT4 and Apocalypse throughout this video. I'm going to be discussing the story, characters, and endings in detail, so if you don't want to get spoiled, click off the video now and come back once you've played the games for yourself. With that out of the way, let's get started. Apocalypse takes place during the neutral route of SMT4. Lucifer and Merkaba are about to go to war, and humanity has put their faith in Flynn to put a stop to it. However, unlike last time, we're not in control of Flynn. Meet Nanashi, a 15-year-old boy who along with his best friend Asahi is training to become a hunter. During a routine supply run, Nanashi and his mentors are attacked by the demon Adramelech and are killed in front of Asahi's eyes. On the road to the underworld, Nanashi comes across the Celtic god Dagda and is given an offer. Dagda is willing to revive Nanashi and grant him power, under the agreement that he'll become Dagda's personal god slayer. But we're not entirely sure what that means just yet, Nanashi ends up accepting the deal so he can defend Asahi. When everything calms down, Nanashi and Asahi try their best to move past the deaths of their comrades, and try to prove themselves as hunters. Not too long after completing some quests, they're approached by this mysterious old man who reveals himself to be the deity Odin. He noticed that Nanashi and Asahi have a desperate drive to help out the people of Tokyo, and he tells them of a demon that's been sealed away beneath the Kanda Shrine. Odin says that this demon will fight for humanity's side in the upcoming war, and Nanashi and Asahi are the only ones that can break its seal. Eager to prove themselves, the two rush off to the Ark only to find out that they were tricked by Odin, because upon freeing the demon, the truth is revealed. This is Krishna, the eighth reincarnation of the god Vishnu and leader of the group known as the Divine Powers. Krishna and his group view humanity as people trapped in cages and wishes to destroy God and create a new universe outside of his control. To accomplish this goal, Krishna summons the serpent Shesha to wage war against the forces of law and chaos, while also kidnapping Flynn so he can convert the young samurai into his own god slayer. And with that, the stage is set. Much like the original SMT4, the plot is quite simple. It's up to Nanashi and his comrades to find a way to defeat Shesha, stop the divine powers, rescue Flynn, and take back Tokyo for humanity. However, unlike most mainline SMT stories, this plot is almost entirely character focused. I didn't mention it during the summary, but a good majority of the game's opening hours are spent establishing characters and their motives. Apocalypse has a very traditional take on party members this time around, as throughout the game, more and more people end up joining your team. I already mentioned Asahi and Dagda, but we're also introduced to the Queen of the Fairies Nozomi, the spirit of a returning Navarre, and a few more that join the group later in the game. The main meat of the plot comes from how these characters develop throughout the story, less in terms of alignment but more so in personal growth. Don't get me wrong, there are still alignments in SMT4A, however they're handled differently here than in the original game, but that's something that I want to talk about later. Overall, I think that the intro to 4 Apocalypse does a pretty good job at getting us back into the swing of things, but I do think the story takes a bit longer to become interesting this time around. The original SMT4 did a great job at not only introducing us to the major players, but also hooking the audience through intrigue. While the Kingdom of Mikado may have seemed like a typical fantasy setting on the outside, throughout the opening, hints were dropped that something wasn't quite right. The layers were slowly peeled back until the big reveal at the end of the tutorial section. This was a great way to not only hook new players into this world, but also provide something fresh for SNT veterans. Apocalypse in comparison decides to forego a mystery for the sake of showing off the daily lives of the people of Tokyo. This works well as a piece of world building since it gives a lot of detail as to how the hunter associations operate. We get to see Nanashi and Asahi take on small jobs to build their reputation and improve their skills. While this is fine on its own, it isn't as memorable as the mystery built up in the original game, while also taking longer for the main conflict to be introduced. But before I continue with the story discussion, I want to talk about the gameplay aspects first. SMT4 Apocalypse shares the same core gameplay as its predecessor, however there are enough tweaks and changes made to the formula that warrant a second look. I mostly want to focus 
on the differences between this game and the original title. So if you haven't already, then I suggest you watch my video on SMT4 to get a good idea as to what was introduced and how I feel about the additions. But too long didn't watch, SMT4 built its core gameplay off of the ideas introduced in Nocturne, while also adding some new ideas of its own, some of which I thought were great, while others left a lot to be desired. Apocalypse sets out to refine the aspects of SMT4 while also introducing new ideas of its own. Character customization is largely unchanged. App customization and demon skill whispering work the same as they did before, but with a few minor differences. A couple of new apps have been introduced, such as the ones that nullify poison and extra apps that help out with demon negotiation. The returning apps from 4 have also been tweaked a bit in an attempt to make them more balanced, but I'm honestly not a big fan of how they went about doing this. Integral apps such as skill expansion and demon skill plus are now locked behind a protagonist level alongside their premium prices. I'm not sure what the intent behind this decision was. Part of what makes the app point system such a fun tool to play around with is the fact that you have a lot of flexibility and player choice. You have to always consider your options and make the somewhat difficult decision as to what you should be prioritizing. Should I invest in the scout app tree to try to get more bonuses when recruiting demons? Or maybe instead I should get the demon skill plus app so I have more skills to put on my party members when fusing. While Apocalypse still does have this decision making for most apps, locking what is arguably the most desirable apps behind the player's level does nothing except railroad character progression. I ended up hoarding hundreds of app points because I wanted to get the skill expansion apps as soon as they would become available. Since the game doesn't tell you what level you need to be until a threshold is met, I was pretty discouraged to buy any other apps out of the worry of missing out on the ones that I really wanted. I understand that this is more of a me problem, but I think that the app system is a bit of a step back here because of the issues that I mentioned. Demon Whispering is largely unchanged aside from the way skill affinity works. As a quick reminder, every time one of your demons learns its final skill, they'll enter the Whispering state. During this, you can select any skill to transfer over to Nanashi, with passive skills and demon exclusive skills being off limits. If a demon with a skill Nanashi already has enters the Whisper state, that skill will increase by a single rank. The rank of your skills will have an impact on their effectiveness and efficiency. For example, attack skills will not only deal more damage the higher the rank, but they'll also cost less MP. In the original game, skill affinity only counted for the protagonist. In Apocalypse, this mechanic now applies to your demons as well albeit in a slightly different way. Demons come with a fixed affinity, which is supposed to dictate which elements and skills they specialize in. However, unlike Nanashi, a demon can have a poor affinity with skills. When this is the case, the skill will not only deal less damage, but in the case of buffs and healing magic, it'll cost more MP to cast those spells. I mentioned in my video on SMT4 that skill affinity wasn't something that you needed to worry about too much. Sure, it was helpful, but it was more than possible to get by without paying too much attention to it, since it only had an impact on Flynn. Apocalypse puts a much larger emphasis on this by not only making this system now apply to everyone, but also through rebalancing the MP economy. Skills in general cost a lot more MP this time around. Support and healing magic especially have an insanely high price now. This was all done to encourage players to master the skill affinity system, and while I was a bit mixed on the idea at first, I find this to be a great decision at the end of the day. Skill affinity not only gives new layers of complexity and identity to a demon, but it also awards the player for having more specialized builds. It's impossible to make a one-size-fits-all demon because they'll almost always have a drawback because of their affinities. While you can make dedicated support demons or ones that focus on physical attacks, you have to make sure that their affinities can take full advantage of those builds. While you're rewarded for sticking with those affinities, there isn't a punishment for including skills your demon isn't great with. This is because even if a skill isn't great for said demon, you can still still whispered onto Nanashi when given the chance to. Hell, affinity doesn't even matter when doing a fusion chain since you're not even going to be using that demon for combat anyways. Just make sure that the demon you're eventually going to fuse has the proper affinities for the skills you want to include. Speaking of which, fusion in this game is the same for the most part aside from a few extra additions. When doing a fusion search, you now have the option to specify a level range you want to fuse. I personally never needed to use this option, but it's there in case you want to find a demon of a certain level. A new 
item was added known as the Compendium Ticket. These items are awarded after completing certain quests, and are essentially a voucher to take one demon out of your Compendium for free. There aren't many of these in the game, but they're super useful when you need to bring back a pricey demon. I'm not sure if this is confirmation bias, but I noticed that the Compendium was a lot more expensive in this game. Even with all of the apps to reduce the price, some demons cost a hefty amount of Maka to summon, though that could be because the demons in question had a lot of powerful skills on them. I just felt that there were a couple of times where I needed to grind money so I can summon the demons I needed for fusion, and since this was the game to introduce the compendium tickets, I'm inclined to believe that this wasn't a coincidence. The last addition to the fusion system is the option to do a basic 2 demon fusion without having to use the search command. This is exactly what I was asking for in my video on the original game, and I'm glad to see it be implemented. All this does is make things such as element fusion much quicker, especially if you already know what to two demons you want to use. Of course, the fusion search function is more than usable, and I still got a lot of use out of it. I just like having the option to do it manually, because in a lot of cases it's faster. And finally, there are the changes made to the battle system. Mechanically speaking, things are the exact same, but there are two major differences that, in my opinion, do nothing but improve the game's combat. For starters, the partner system has been given a much larger focus. In the original SMT4, partners would be randomly selected depending on who was currently traveling with Flynn. While this was a neat idea, I found it to be more detrimental than useful since they were prone to making really bad decisions that could result in a game over. Apocalypse not only fixes this issue by improving the AI, but the entire partner system has been expanded. You gradually unlock partners throughout the game, and by the end of the story there are a total of 7 partners to choose from. And unlike SMT4, you're able to manually select who you want to have as your partner before the battle starts. Partners are great for making up in an area where you lack in, but come with their own drawbacks to keep them from feeling overpowered. For example, Gaston has some incredibly powerful physical skills. The drawback to having him is that he'll use one of your press turn icons to perform his own actions. While this isn't so bad during random encounters, this effectively makes him pretty useless for boss battles, as Gaston can ruin your strategy if he acts at the wrong time. Hallelujah can prevent status ailments, apply endure to the party, and later on in the game, gains access to fire and ice magic. This makes him pretty good for select encounters, but he uses the endure spell pretty infrequently. My personal favorites ended up being Navar and Toki. Navar specializes in providing buffs to the party and gains access to Dakaja, Dakunda, and even debilitate near the end of the game. This made him my ideal partner during boss battles, as I knew I could save some MP since Navar would have my back. Toki was my go-to for random encounters. She has a chance of instantly killing an enemy on the field. This not only helps with thinning out random encounters, but she can also rake in a ton of experience if she does this on a demon horde. This makes her my preferred character for level grinding. For the most part, I find partners pretty balanced since they're always at the risk of being knocked out in battle. However, partners do provide the player with a certain edge that I'm not a big fan of. Every time your partner acts in battle, the assist gauge gradually fills up. Once it's full, the enemy's turn will be interrupted and your team will not only use the support skill, but also do an all-out attack that deals damage based on how many partners you have unlocked. I'm not the biggest fan of this system to be honest. The main problem is that it's too powerful for something that requires no player skill to activate. The assist gauge fills up whenever your partner performs an action, which is something that happens automatically. While it's true that the assist gauge doesn't fill up when the partner is knocked out, that's not something you can predict or control. With the way the system works now, the assist attack is essentially free damage without any consequence since the enemy's turn is skipped. Whenever I saw that my assist gauge was filled, I'd spend my turn using moves like charge and concentrate, since I knew that there wouldn't be any consequences for such a risky strategy. I understand that this feature exists to show the camaraderie between the characters, and while it doesn't snap the game balance in two, I don't think that it was a necessary inclusion. This brings us to the final change made to combat, that being the massive retooling of the smirk system. Smirking in SMT4 was unbalanced to say the least. To make a long story short, smirking was introduced as an extra bonus for the player for taking advantage of the press turn system. However, its implementation left a lot to be desired. The main issue with smirk in the original game is that it was way too powerful of a buff for how easy it was to activate. As a result, the difficulty of certain battles was incredibly unbalanced depending on who would get the buff. While it was an interesting idea, it was something that I ultimately wasn't a fan of. SMT4 Apocalypse sets out to rebalance the smirk system and make it a more worthwhile addition. Overall, I think that the game does a pretty good job at doing so. For starters, 
you no longer get a boost to evasion, and the attack increase has been severely nerfed. The increase is still somewhat noticeable, but you're not going to be doing double the damage like last time. However, critical hit rate and accuracy has been increased to 100%. Additionally, magic attacks also score critical hits while smirking, meaning all attacks can now net you extra press turn icons. The biggest change made to the smirk system is that certain attacks now have bonus effects while smirking. The best example of this would be with the revamped Hama and Mudo spells. Light and Dark skills now deal elemental damage, but when you use one of these skills while smirking, then there's a chance that their instant kill effect will come into play. While there aren't many skills that come with a unique smirking effect, a lot of the more powerful or demon exclusive skills have been rebalanced with smirking in mind. On the surface, it might seem cheap to lock these bonuses behind a buff tied to luck, but there's more than one way to activate smirk. On the overworld, whenever you successfully get a preemptive strike, there's a chance that some of your party members will start smirking. The opposite is also true, so the enemy can start the battle with a smirk if you aren't careful. A new form of charge and concentrate has been added specifically for the smirk system. The skill Smile Charge bestows the user with a smirk for the natural cost of 50 MP. However, the skill McGoin was also introduced, which acts as a way to remove smirk. The system is far more controllable this time around, making it possible to build demons around this mechanic. It's not something I did personally, but the option is there if you want it. Thanks to the changes Apocalypse brings to the table, the smirk system has gone from a half-hearted attempt to innovate the gameplay to being a well-executed mechanic that's core to the identity of the combat system. When taking all of this into account, I believe that the core combat here is a vast improvement over the original title. Apocalypse wasn't trying to reinvent the wheel, but more so refine the ideas that were introduced in 4. Skill affinity and smirking used to feel tacked on, but are now able to be justified as worthwhile additions. This is due in part to how much significance they now have. The skill affinity system has gone from something that could be somewhat ignored into a core part of how you build your demons and Nanashi. Smirking went from a flimsy way of encouraging weakness exploits to a new layer of strategy that can be incorporated into battle. But what I find to be the most impressive part of all this is that the game still manages to be balanced. Boss battles in particular were some of my favorite parts of the game. It's not just about knowing the enemy's weakness and going to town with your strongest skills. MP management is more important than ever, especially during the few encounters where you have to fight two bosses without getting a break. The part where you have to fight both Merkaba and Lucifer back to back was pretty intense. You have to be smart with how you spend your MP, because without a level up, there's no way to recover in between fights. I was initially annoyed by this at first, but I grew to appreciate the challenge after giving it some thought. It required me to plan ahead and find the best way to ration my MP so I wouldn't be burned out by the second fight. The core combat of SMT4 Apocalypse is one of the best in the series, but when looking at an RPG, it's important to consider the gameplay outside of battle. When it comes to the level design and map, a lot of it is reused from the original game. This game looks pretty decent for 3DS standards, and while the textures are a bit muddy, the oppressive atmosphere still remains. While this helps to make things consistent, this sadly means that the same trappings I had still apply. The dungeon design is grounded for the most part, but this comes with the sacrifice of having interesting level structure. They do try to mend this with the introduction of Navar's Jade Dagger. Whenever you come across these power spots, you can temporarily charge up Navar's Dagger. Navar will float alongside Nanashi, and you can use him to distract enemies or destroy certain walls blocking your path. The idea is that you're supposed to plan out the quickest route out so you can reach these walls before Navar runs out of power, and while this gimmick in theory should provide the player with some sort of problem solving in the dungeons, in execution, this idea is very underutilized. Not many areas require you to use Navar's dagger to progress. This mechanic is mostly used for the player to score some optional treasures, and while it is somewhat rewarding, the puzzles themselves are very simplistic. I believe that this is mostly a consequence of having to stick to the level design of the original game. Some of the areas did see slight redesigns to make them more interesting to explore, but it's not enough to fully break free from the familiarity. On the plus side, there are some unique locations not found in the original title. I would say that these new dungeons are better overall, but they still lean a bit too heavy on the simplistic side for my liking. As I said before, there are people who don't want their RPG dungeons to be overly confusing or long, and I totally get that. But for me anyways, I like my dungeons to have a bit more meat on their bones, and unique games gameplay ideas that keep them from blending in with one another. Of course, even I have my limits, but the dungeons in the SMT4 games don't do enough to stick out from each other for me. I'm not entirely sure if this is a hot take or not, but I think that the final dungeon, Universe, is probably my favorite dungeon in the duology. It's an incredible
incredibly long dungeon, don't get me wrong, but I like that there's a lot of optional treasure you can find, and you can activate shortcuts if you meet the right requirements. Visually speaking, however, things do blend in with each other, making it hard to distinguish areas. Another problem that it suffers from is its overly spacious level design. I understand that this was to add a sense of scale, but it can get pretty tedious to walk from one area to another. I guess I may as well mention it here, but the spell Estoma has also been tweaked to resemble its classic counterpart. No matter how you slice it, Estoma Sword in SMT4 was really gimmicky. In that game, Estoma Sword allowed you to ward off enemy encounters while exploring, as long as you could connect to your attack. This was an unnecessary step that could cause some problems. When you're ambushed by a group of enemies, it's impossible to hit them all without getting into an encounter. The best you could do is try to outrun them, but that wasn't always possible. In Apocalypse, Estoma now emits a barrier around Nanashi. If a lower level enemy runs into it, then they'll instantly be defeated. This is much better than what we had before, and we're even able to refresh Estoma without pausing the game now, which is a nice touch. This is probably why I didn't find the last dungeon as tedious as other players. If you're going to play this game, then do yourself a favor and get Estoma as soon as you can, as it makes backtracking in later dungeons much more comfortable. Just like with the original game, there's a decent variety of optional content. Challenge quests make their return, and this time around, they aren't required to finish the game. In terms of quality, the quests are serviceable. A lot of them boil down to doing optional fights against strong demons, and some variety of fetch quests. They're worth doing more so for the rewards, since they go by pretty quickly and aren't super challenging. I'm more forgiving to the challenge quests here than previously, because they're completely optional. However, if you're looking for a challenge, then you'll find it in the optional boss fights. When you reach the end game, you gain access to this area known as Twisted Tokyo. This optional dungeon features high level demons to fight, and every few floors, you'll be able to battle one of the fiends. Fiends were also in the original SMT4, but they were incredibly annoying to fight. While some of them were tied to challenge quests, a good majority of fiends were random encounters that had a 1 in 256 chance of appearing in certain areas. It was too much of a pain for me to do personally, and I'm glad to see it be changed in Apocalypse. However, for one reason or another, fiend battles now have a time limit of 10 turns. If you fail to beat the fiend in the given time, you'll be booted out of Twisted Tokyo and you'll have to fight him again. But what's confusing about this decision is that the fight resumes exactly where it left off, making the time limit more frustrating than interesting. If you're one hit away from beating a fiend and are kicked out, you have to make your way all the way back to the fiend so you can land the killing blow. All this does is waste time and gives you a chance to heal your party. I feel as though the intention was to force players to maximize their damage output and know the enemy's weakness so they can beat the fiend within the given time. Failure to do so would mean you'd have to fight the boss from scratch. In practice, there is no punishment for failure other than needing to backtrack to the boss. It's definitely unnecessary, but it's not enough to ruin the dungeon for me. However, if you're not completely satisfied with the content on offer here and have a few bucks to spend, then this game does offer some DLC that might be up your alley. These range from cosmetics, an extra difficulty, an option to remove the level cap, and some extra challenge quests to take part in. Just like last time, there is DLC relating to experience, app points, and money grinding. My stance on this still hasn't changed. I'm not a big fan of this DLC, but I can at least acknowledge that it's optional and the game is already balanced enough without it. I don't have any issues with giving players a choice as to whether or not they want to buy this DLC, but I still think the mere inclusion should be questioned. This time around, I actually ended up buying the extra challenge quests just to get an educated opinion on them. There's the inverted pyramid quest, which features a boss battle against Cleopatra, a trip to Hawaii, where Nanashi sells his soul to the demon Mephisto so he and his friends can go on vacation. This one also ends with a boss battle with the demon in question, though I personally was a bit overprepared for this fight since it wasn't too difficult. And finally, the Messiahs of the Diamond Realm DLC, which is easily my favorite. This short story sees Nanashi teaming up with the protagonists of previous numbered installments to fight Steven, a legacy character who invented the original demon summoning program in SMT1. This is fan service done right. The other protagonists are more than just a cool callback, because during the fight with Steven, you get to control them in their own party. The fight itself is a ton of fun, especially if you crank up the difficulty to Apocalypse. You're going to need to bring your A game for this fight, since it's designed for players that have mastered the mechanics and have a party filled with the best demons and skills. This is my favorite boss battle in the game, and it's easily the best piece of DLC Atlas has ever put out. I hope to see something similar in SMT5, because callbacks like this are right up my alley. With all of this considered, SMT4 Apocalypse has some of the strongest core gameplay in the mainline series, 
series. However, I don't think I can call it my favorite overall. The main battle system is fantastic, and I think that the developers did a legitimately good job at improving the ideas introduced in the original game. Skill affinity and smirking is now a core part of Apocalypse's identity, and I can't imagine this game without either system. However, outside of the combat, the level design is still a bit too simplistic for my liking. From a gameplay perspective, they all blend in with each other, and when things start to get a bit more interesting, the game is almost over. Part of the reason why Nocturne is still my favorite mainline entry is because it had fun and interesting dungeons on top of the already great gameplay. Sure, not all of them were winners, but each one provided a unique gimmick to keep it memorable. The 4 duology lacks this, and I'm not sure if it was because of hardware constraints or just a shift in Atlas's design philosophy. However, this is just one of the few low points, and it isn't enough to ruin the gameplay experience. With all of that out of the way, it's time to dive into the minutia of this game's plot. To repeat what I said earlier, SMT4 Apocalypse is one of the most divisive Mega 10 games within the community. While Apocalypse is generally considered to be one of the best playing SMT games, the story and characters are their own can of worms. In order to properly explain why, I'm going to have to go into a lot of detail. So as a quick reminder, there are going to be spoilers throughout the rest of the video. No matter what I end up saying about the story, I can recommend Apocalypse purely from a gameplay standpoint. So if you haven't played the game yet, I highly suggest you do so before watching the rest of this video. With that said, it's time to go into a bit more detail as to what's going on here. As a brief reminder, Krishna and the Divine Powers act as the game's central antagonist. Their plan is to create a universe free from God's control, and outside of the influence of law and chaos. To accomplish this, Krishna summons the deity Shesha to wreak havoc over Tokyo for the sake of collecting souls. This is so that he can eventually transform into the Cosmic Egg, which will eventually hatch and create a new universe. However, this will come at the cost of destroying the current world. Once his universe is born, Krishna will transform Flynn into a weapon capable of killing God himself. While this setup isn't any more or less complex than the original SMT4, the difference lies in what the story's priorities are. The last game was heavily focused on exploring the way Tokyo operates. We got to interact with every faction, which not only helps build a somewhat realistic world, but it's also used to flesh out the beliefs of the characters. This was integral to the story, since it helped make the alignment split feel natural and the ultimatum you're presented with all the more effective. While the characters were established and there was a bit you could read into through their interactions, this ends up taking a back seat to the alignments that they represent. The alignment debate has always been a huge part of this series' identity and while it still exists to some extent, the characters are now at the forefront of the story. The main meat of the plot comes from the personal growth of the party members that join Nanashi throughout the journey. Aside from the ones I mentioned at the start of the video, we're also joined by a member of each faction. There's the young member of the Ashurakai Hallelujah, the leader of Mikado's Crusaders Gaston, and the emotionally shut off Ring of Gaia member Toki. Izabo also joins the party on occasion, but she's more so a guest member than a mainstay. When looking at this group as a whole, this is a far more traditional party than what we're used to seeing in mainline SMT, and while the idea doesn't bother me personally, I find that the execution lacks in a lot of areas. The characters have defined personality traits and are likable to some degree, but beyond that, meaningful development and depth feel only serviceable at best, and for a story that rides and dies on its cast, this is a major issue. I think that there are good ideas for characters here, but it's too rushed for their developments to have the meaning or impact that the writers were going for. Navar is a great character on paper. At some point during SMT4, Navar couldn't handle the pressure that came along with being a samurai and decided to abandon the duty. This brought great shame to Navar and his family name, so he decided to leave Mikado and take refuge in Tokyo. After his death, he remained a ghost only visible to those with a spiritual connection. Navar's main character arc is learning to regain his confidence while also bettering himself as a man. As I said, this is a good idea on paper. The problem is that any time Navar has any sort of personal growth, it's undermined by a joke at his expense. The game rarely takes Navar seriously, which ends up leading to a lot of tonal whiplashes when the game makes unnecessary attempts at humor during these personal scenes. Navar isn't the only character to suffer from poor writing choices either. Toki is a standout example of a character with a lot of potential that sadly goes underutilized. She was introduced to the Ring of Gaia at a young age and was forced to follow their ideals. While at first it seems as though Toki believes in their cause, but we learn her true feelings not too long after she joins. Toki is treated as nothing but a puppet for the Ring of Gaia, and desires to leave the cult since they've lost sight of their original chaotic alignment. Toki ends up 
permanently joining the group so that she can follow her own path. I thought that this was a pretty compelling setup for her character. So you should have seen the look on my face when it turns out that this is all that was done with her. I'm not kidding, after Toki leaves the ring of Gaia, she almost exclusively acts as firepower for the group. She does become involved with this underdeveloped and, quite frankly, unnecessary love triangle between her, Asahi, and Nanashi, but other than that, the game never explores her ideals past her intro. What is the ideal chaos that Toki mentions? Does she feel any regret for leaving her only home behind? At no point does the game try to expand her character further, and it's such a missed opportunity. And that's the best way to sum up my thoughts on the party members. A lot of the characters have very interesting backstories or motives that are ripe for exploration, but Apocalypse only does the bare minimum with these ideas, and it's very frustrating to see. My personal favorite character in the game is Gaston, but even he suffers from this problem. Gaston is introduced as the commander of Mikado's elite samurai group known as the Crusaders. They're a team that assists Nanashi and his companions in the battle against Sheisha. We see that early on that Gaston has a very high and mighty attitude, and views his companions as lesser than him. He has a very elitist attitude thanks to him being raised in the upper class of Mikado. He ends up getting a decent character arc where he learns to respect his team and even ends up rebelling against Merkaba's ideals. He goes as far as destroying the weapon that he was gifted with, symbolizing his resolve. It's nothing wholly original, but I find that there was enough time spent with this character to have his change feel satisfying. We get to see the many different sides of this character. Despite his attitude towards certain people, he's a good-hearted person underneath it all and has a strong moral code. I think that he's a perfectly fine character, but there's a secondary story staring them right in the face and I'm shocked that they never took advantage of. We learn that Gaston is actually the younger brother of Navarre. Gaston became a samurai in order to repair the damage Navarre brought to the family name. He has a deep-rooted hatred for his brother and wanted to be nothing like him. It takes until Gaston finds his new resolve as a samurai for him to finally start seeing Navarre's spirit. However, instead of giving us any scenes where the brothers repair their relationship and get a new understanding of each other, it's brushed aside and nothing is done with it. Do you see what I mean when I say that there's more that could have been done with these characters? Something that I found strange is that this game features an inbox where characters occasionally send you messages. Most of these are characters reacting to different events in the story, while some of them include important details, such as Gaston making a proper burial for Navarre. I don't like how this is something that's tucked away behind menus since players can easily miss it. I would have loved to have seen these scenes implemented into the main story to give us more meat to the characters. Something that I want to clarify is that I don't hate this cast. For the most part, I think that they get the job done. The problem is that for a game that's trying to be more character focused than before, the writers didn't go all the way with it. There's no doubt that the characters here are technically more fleshed out than any other mainline game, but those games didn't prioritize character depth. Mainline SMT has always been about the thematic storytelling and the discussion that comes with that. However, this doesn't mean that the past games did a poor job at establishing the characters. They were developed enough for the stories that those games were trying to tell. 4A clearly wants to do something different with its story, and I'm all for the idea, but they didn't go all the way with it. What we end up getting are some alright characters, with serviceable at best development attached to them. It's nothing bad in my opinion, but it's very basic, and it's not hard to see the cracks upon a closer inspection. If you're not a fan of the characters on offer, then this story isn't for you. As much as I would like to say the alignments make up for the characters, I sadly can't. Something that I can compliment is that this game has a fresh spin on the alignment system. Instead of debating between Law and Chaos, the game instead sets out to explore the different sides of neutral. While Law and Chaos endings are still in Apocalypse, it feels like they were included as an obligation rather than as worthwhile routes. They result in early bad endings and feel rushed, which makes me think that this was a last second inclusion to appease fans. However, what I really want to talk about are the two main routes, known as Bonds and Massacre. While both routes are considered neutral aligned routes, they handle the idea of neutrality in different ways. Dogda is meant to represent Dark Neutral. On paper, his goals are very similar to the Divine Powers. Dogda desires to create a new universe free from God's control, but what he yearns for above all else is independence. He views humanity's reliance on others and their confinement in deities as a crutch stunting their own growth. What Dogda wants with the new universe is to elevate humanity into the realm of godhood and give them enough knowledge of the world so that they can become self-reliant. As a result, deities would cease to have a physical form and return to just being a part of nature. To accomplish this goal, Dogda plans on using Nanashi to kill Krishna, the divine powers, and God. After that, he'll hijack the cosmic 
egg and hatch a new universe under his ideals. In return for his actions, Nanashi will become the creator of the new universe, and Dogdo leaves it up to him to guide humanity. Light Neutral, on the other hand, follows the more traditional ideologies that we're used to seeing. This ending involves the people of Tokyo banding together to destroy the influence of law and chaos in order to move into the future on their own. It's nothing that we haven't seen before, but Apocalypse was a much greater emphasis on the idea of bonds. The main discussion here is independence versus interdependence. Would humanity be better off if we were given the opportunity to learn and grow by themselves? Or should we work together as a community? One person can make up where another individual falls. This is a very interesting idea, but the problem is that the game doesn't do a good job at presenting these philosophies as equals. This is for a few reasons. Throughout the game, Dogda tries to convince the player that friendship and bonds are a waste of time. In his mind, they'll do nothing but drag you down from reaching your fullest potential. However, Dogda's words hold no weight as we're only shown that the opposite is true. Both in gameplay and story, the party members are shown to be nothing but useful to you and your cause. While there are moments of tension within the group, more often than not, bonds are portrayed as nothing but a good thing. In battles, party members make up where your team composition is lacking. They're an essential tool to help you succeed, and the game even rewards you for keeping your partners alive because of the assist gauge. In terms of the story, the people of Tokyo aren't presented as obstacles in your journey. The closest we get is with Gaston abandoning the group and returning to Mikado, but this was more so in service of his character arc, rather than to be an example of how bonds make you weak. However, I think the most damning example of this alignment bias lies in the fact that the bonds row is objectively the better ending between the two. I don't mean this in terms of execution, but more so in the consequences of the outcome. The anarchy route requires you to kill your friends so you can collect their souls to hatch the cosmic egg. This is portrayed as a massive betrayal to your ideals up until this point, and the game makes you linger on each party member you strike down. This is the consequence that comes with wanting to rebuild the world. The companions you once had now stand in opposition to you, and you have to justify to yourself that this ideal is worth sacrificing your old friends over. The bonds are in comparison has no consequences. In fact, it actively works to minimize consequences by undoing the fate of a certain character. Just before the Cosmic Egg dungeon is unlocked, it's revealed that the divine powers are still alive. Their plan was to fake their own death so that the Hunters of Tokyo would take care of Lucifer and Merkaba, all the while being none the wiser that Shesha is posing as Flynn. After the truth is revealed, Shesha attacks Nanashi, but Asahi sacrifices herself at the last second and is consumed by the demon. This is one of my favorite scenes in the game. Asahi was a character that was desperate to grow up. She hated being treated like a kid, and her character arc is focused on her struggles stepping into adulthood. Her death scene works as a great book end for her character. Without a second thought, she made the most adult decision and sacrificed herself for the sake of protecting her best friend. It's a great scene on its own, but the Bonds rope completely undoes the impact of this scene because Asahi ends up getting revived by the goddess Danu. This is a bad decision because all it does is remove the lasting consequences of a character's death, and this scene is locked behind the Bonds route, so it feels as though this was only done to entice players even further to pick it. The mainline Shin Megami Tensei series has always been about presenting the player with morally gray ultimatums. It was up to the player to align themselves with the philosophy that they believed in and consider the lasting impact their decisions have. Sure, some routes had a bit more content than others, but the series did a good job at presenting all routes as equally valid for the most part. This was all because each route had very noticeable flaws in its core design, and while the Anarchy route follows that trend, the Bond route just doesn't. Everything wraps up far too neatly and cleanly in the end. Asahi is revived, the people of Tokyo and Mikado are able to unite as one civilization, and Nanashi is regarded as a hero that was able to protect the world alongside Flynn. Traditionally, neutral endings come with an air of uncertainty to them. They're seen as temporary solutions to much larger problems, and usually raise the question of whether or not humanity should be trusted to guide themselves. But Apocalypse doesn't do that, because we're shown throughout the game that humanity is able to put aside their differences for the greater good. It's hard to make an argument to go for the Anarchy route when the Bonds route has no drawbacks. However, I want to offer some ways that the writers could have fixed this issue. The first step would be to consistently highlight the flaws of humanity. With the way the story is structured now, the people of Tokyo are portrayed as the underdogs in this situation. Our party consists of characters that come from the different factions around the city. This would have been a great opportunity for some conflict between characters, since their beliefs differ so wildly. Are we able to put aside our personal ideals for the sake of improving the world? 
world? Is it worth it to seek that common ground at all? Or would we be better off relying on ourselves? Of course, the game would still have to convince us that the opposite is also true. Despite our differences, we can move past our egos and gain a better understanding of one another. Show us the flaws of humanity that Dogda talks about, but also the positives of relying on each other so we can come to that conclusion ourselves. This would make the endgame choice far more effective. With the way things are now, the alignments are super disappointing. While the anarchy route is an interesting idea, the game does nothing to convince the player that the choice is worth pursuing, but that's how I feel about it. All in all, I like Shin Megami Tensei 4 Apocalypse. Don't get me wrong, it has a lot of issues. The story settles with just doing the bare minimum, which is a shame because there's a lot of potential here for a great story. All of the pieces are there, but the execution just leaves a lot to be desired. It's carried hard by its cast of characters, and if you're not a fan of what's on offer here, then you're not going to get much out of the plot. However, even if the story isn't your cup of tea, that doesn't mean Apocalypse isn't worth playing. It has some of the best combat in the franchise. Mechanics that were previously undercooked have been polished to a T. Character customization is just as good as in the original game, but with even more to consider because of the revamped skill affinity system. It's a newcomer friendly gameplay experience with a lot to offer for returning players. In terms of which entry I like more, I think that would have to go to the original SMT4. While that game was a bit weaker in terms of gameplay, the overall experience was more consistent. Apocalypse has great highs while also having enough lows to make my playthrough a bit bumpier. Both games are definitely worth your time, but if I had to choose between one or the other, then I would go with the original. SMT4 Apocalypse is flawed, but to say that it's a bad game would be far from the truth. It's greater than the sum of its parts, and while it does have things that drag it down from reaching the heights of its predecessor, I can still appreciate what it did well. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I'd like to give a special shout out to all of my channel supporters whose names are on screen now. It's because of these lovely people that I'm able to make videos at the pace I do currently. These videos take a while to make, so if you're at all interested in helping out and donating, you can do so through my Patreon or through channel memberships. I have a few things I can offer in return, such as early video access, a special Discord role, and even some behind the scenes content on occasion. Every donation helps, and if these rewards sound interesting to you, then you can find out more by following the links in the description. I'd also like to give a special shout out to my good friend Ruben. I was falling pretty far behind on this project and he was kind enough to help me out with audio editing. If you're watching this, I can't thank you enough for the help, man. In terms of future projects, I'm going to be alternating between Mega Ten videos and videos on other franchises that I really like to help keep things fresh. So for the next video, I'm going to be covering Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories, and after that all of my focus will be on SMT5, since at the time of this recording, the game is only a month away, and I'm super excited to finally get my hands on it. As always, if you want to stay up to date with my videos, you can find both my Twitter and Discord links in the description. Once again, thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to see you all next time.